Excerpts from Chapter 2 of Liddy Kindly Friends She didn't say nothing about the calf, Liddy said suddenly, in the midst of their sorrowful packing up. She got no cost to, Charles said. We never tell her about it. You know, Charlie, that calf is rightfully ours. He looked at her, his honest head cocked, his eyes dubious. No, truly, we was the ones asked Quaker Stevens to lend us use of his bull. Mama didn't have nothing to do with it. But if they's debts, she's letting out the fields and the horse and cow. She's sending you to be a miller's boy and me to housemaid. She's got us body and soul. We got no call to give her the calf. She set one hand on her waist and straightened her aching back. What do you aim to do with it? Hush, I'm studying on it. Obediently, he quieted and stared in the same direction at the spindly maples that made up their stand of sugar bush. It's a nice fat heifer, she said. We kept it so long on its mother's milk. We'll get a good price for it. We'd be bound to give the money to her. No. Her voice was sharper than she meant, ground as it was on three years of unspoken anger. We always done that, and look where it's got us. No, she said again, this time softly. The money don't go there. She'll give it away to Uncle Judah, who'll give it to that preacher who says you don't need nothing because the world is going to end. She turned to her brother. Charlie, you and me can't think about that. We got to think about keeping this farm for when Papa comes back. We should take that money and bury it someplace, so when we get free we can come back here and have a little seed cash to start over with. Maybe she'll sell the farm. She can't, not so long as Papa's alive. But maybe... We don't know that now, do we? We got to believe he's coming back, or he's sending for us. I hope he don't send for us. We'll persuade him to stay, she said. She wanted for a minute to put her arm around his thin shoulders, but she held back. She didn't want him to think that she considered him less than the man he had so bravely sought to be. We're a good team, eh, Charlie? Pulling shut the door, which, despite all Charles's efforts, still did not close quite flush, they remembered the bear and wondered how they could keep the wild creatures from destroying the cabin in their absence. Finally, Charles suggested that they take all the wood left in the woodpile and stack it in front of the door. It took them close to an hour to accomplish the move, but... Sweating and breathing hard, they admired their fortress effect. That made it a little easier for them to go. Charlie rode bareback astride the plow horse, his brown heels dug into the horse's wide flanks. Liddy, leading the cow, followed close by. Do you mind too much going to the mill? she asked. He shrugged. I don't rightly know. Don't seem too bad. Dusty, I reckon, and not much time to be lazy, eh? She laughed. You wouldn't know how to be lazy, Charlie. He smiled at the compliment. I'd rather be home. She sighed. We'll be back, Charlie, I promise. They were both quiet a moment, remembering their father saying almost the same words. Truly, she added, I'm sure of it. He smiled. Sure, he said. They were in sight now of Quaker Stevens' farm. They could see him, his broad-brimmed straight black hat, surrounded by the black hats of his three grown sons. They had the oxen yoked to a sled, which was already half-loaded with stones, and were digging away at more stones buried in a newly cleared field. Their farmhouse, close to the road, 
had been added on to over the years. The outlines of the first salt box could be made out on the northern end, which melted on the back side into a larger frame Cape Cod, then an L that served as shed, storage, privy, and corridor to two barns, the larger one growing out of the smaller. They were rich for all their Quaker adherence to the simple life. Quaker Stevens walked toward them from his field. I see my bull served thee well, he said, smiling. His face was broad and red, his hair curly and gray about his ears. Great caterpillar eyebrows crowned his kindly eyes. We come to thank you, Liddy began, thinking fast, wanting to be fair and honest, but at the same time, wanting a large price for the calf that she knew in her heart was partly his. Thee brought these beasts five miles down the road for that? He asked, his woolly eyebrows high up on his forehead. Liddy blushed. The truth is, we're taking the horse and cow to Mr. Westcott in payment of debt, and we're obliged to sell off this pretty calf straight away. Our mothers put us out to work. These leaving thy land? It's let as well, she said, allowing just a tiny hint of sadness to creep into her voice. Charles here and I was waiting for our father to come back from the west, but... Thee's been alone all winter, just thee two children? She could feel Charles stiffen beside her. We managed fine, she said. He took off his hat again and wiped his face and neck. I should have come to call on my neighbors, he said quietly. She sensed a weakness. You wouldn't be interested. No, surely not. You got a mighty herd already. I'll give thee twenty dollars for the calf, he said quickly. No, twenty-five. I know the sire, and he's of a good line. He smiled. Liddy pretended to think. Seems mighty high, she said. She's half yours by rights, Charles blurted out before Liddy could elbow him quiet. His honesty would be her death yet. But the kind man persisted. It's a fair price for a nice, fat little heifer. These kept her well. He invited them to have lunch with his family where his wife served a meal heartier than they'd had all winter. The Quaker's wife also suggested that their son, Luke, take Liddy and Charles into town on their wagon. Luke Stevens tied the horse and cow to the back of the wagon and then came around to give Liddy a hand up, but she pretended not to see. She clutched the bag that held the money from selling the calf as they drove toward town. Then the farm will just lie fallow? Luke was asking Charles. No, it's let. The fields and pasture and sugar bush for the debt. The house and shed will just leave be. I hope the snow don't do in the roofs. I could stop by. Would thee like me to stop by? Shovel the snow off the roof if need be? No need, she started, but Charles was already thanking him for his kindness. I'd be obliged, he said. It would take the worry off. Liddy and me aim to keep it standing against Papa's return. Don't make it trouble for yourself, though. It'd be no trouble, Luke said kindly. At a livelier clip, they took the river road toward Baker's Mill. I can walk from here easy, Charles protested. But Luke shook him off. Faster I get home, sooner I'm hauling rocks, he said, laughing. She didn't want Luke Stevens watching while she bid Charles goodbye, but again maybe it was better. She might weaken if they were alone, and that would never do. I'll only be in the village, she said. Maybe you can drop up. Charles put his little hand on her arm. You mustn't worry, eh, Liddy? he said. You'll be all right. Luke nodded his head with a dip of his funny black hat. This here is Cutler's Tavern, he said. They hadn't spoken since they left the mill. 
Shall I come to the door with thee? The wagon had stopped before a low stone wall, hung with a rail gate. She was horrified. No, no need, she said. They might not understand me riding up with a... She scrambled to the ground. Luke smiled. Liddy didn't know whether to be pleased or annoyed as he clicked his tongue and the horse pulled the wagon away, leaving Liddy alone in her new life.